Good morning, this is Norco Christian Church Worship Online. I will be continuing my series of messages through the book of Hebrews today, the gospel according to Hebrews from the Cowboys perspective. We're glad to have you with us. We'll begin our service in just a moment. God bless you for being with us today. Good morning, and uh, welcome uh, to an Altonless <laughs> Sunday. So virtual, but it'll be interesting. We'll see how it goes, and I think you'll enjoy it. But uh, let's first bow our heads in a word of prayer and ask God's blessing on us today. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your love, your grace, your power, and your majesty. We thank you so much for the opportunity to come into your presence to have you guide us and to lead us. I ask, Lord, that you would watch over this assembly, that you would bless the people that are here and those who couldn't make it. And we just ask, Lord, that we would be focused on you and that your love would shine through. We thank you so much, Jesus, for all your love and your care. It is in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. And since Alton's not here, I'm gonna do the bulletin first instead of at the end. <laughs> so if you want to take a look at there, uh, in your bulletins, we've got the current victory offering and uh, several items there. The one thing that I want to point out is that the Bible study is going to be restarting on Wednesday nights and uh, resuming on February 3rd. So that is this Wednesday. And uh, we might have a... Uh, there might be it might be postponed till next week, but uh, we'll find out from Alton. We'll see what happens. Uh, Saturday, February thirteenth, will be the men's prayer breakfast, and uh, uh, we would uh, just throw that o open invitation for all the men to come there and uh, enjoy a time of fellowship. We also serve breakfast, so it's uh, it's a fun time as well. But uh, if you uh, take a look at the uh, victory offering goal and where we're at right now and then uh, we have our theme for the year and I think that's all I need to announce unless there's something that uh, I've missed please join us in our next hymn Hallelujah Square Yeah. 
We come to our communion time, the time to reflect and to remember what Jesus did for us on the cross. And uh, as uh, Ralph, are you doing the prayer this morning? Okay. As Ralph leads us in a word of prayer. Prepare our hearts and minds. I'd like to ask everyone to stand, please, and, uh, and join in this word of prayer. Thank you very much, Ralph. Jesus, thank you for our youth group today. Jesus, thank you for our missionaries, and we pray that they will be safe to share your gospel with all who don't know you. Lord, we thank you that despite challenges, we have the joy that you offer each day. Thank you for America's democracy, and we pray that we will keep our freedom to express our views. We pray that any person losing their jobs will not lose the ability to provide for their families, we pray that jobs will not be lost at the expense of misguided policies of any government leaders and that their actions will be led by rational and honest thinking based upon the principles of our Bible. Thank you, Lord, that despite forces to the contrary, we keep America pro-Christian. Thank you for Pastor Alton's message today. And we pray that will affect not only what we think, but what we do. Thank you for all that are part of our church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you haven't uh, picked up your uh, communion, it's in the back table there. And uh, as we sing this song, please partake of communion. Last night, I was uh, on the internet reading about uh, a place in Crete called Gnosis, where uh, if you know anything about it, it's a fascinating Minoan town and things like that. And I was getting really into looking at it, and basically I was led that way because of a Bible study or something that we had looked at. So it was very interesting, and then my phone goes off late, and Alton starts off, and he says, hi, uh, uh, Bob? I said, yeah. And he says, um... I'm not going to be there tomorrow. And all I could think of was like, he's asking me to do the sermon now? <laughs> <laughs> so, fortunately that's not the case, and this will be a little bit interesting, and uh, we've already done a kind of a, a little bit of a preview of it, and uh, but because uh, we had to do sound check. But Alton is here, I'm pretty certain that uh, 
He, uh, his mind is on us right now, but hopefully he's sleeping. So I will let him talk to you. Good morning. It is so good to have all of you here today, even though I am not. I have come down with a cold, I think, but I've got a cough, and I know the uh, psychological atmosphere of the medical field today and how we view all of that, so I am going to stay home today and bring you my message via video. So here we go. Once again, I am so glad you are faithful and that you are here. Reflect His image. God builds great people to build great things. We are going once again to Hebrews the 11th chapter, verse 1. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. Now the meaning of that verse is implying the fact that the ancients, those people in the Old Testament, looked forward to the coming of Christ. They did not see it, but they had faith that Christ would come. And now we have faith that He will come back and we will get to share eternity with Him in heaven. And then the scripture continues. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. And then let me go down to verse 32 of Hebrews 11. And what more shall I say, the writer of Hebrews says, I do not have time to tell about Gideon and Barak and Samson, Jephthah and David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and rooted for foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. Now, I'm going to talk to you today about, well, Basically one person. I was going to talk to you about Samuel and David. Samuel comes before David, although in Hebrews he lists David before Samuel, but in historical chronological order Samuel comes before David. So we are going to talk about Samuel today and some of the things that happened in his life as I got on into my sermon preparation, I found out I didn't have time to talk to you about David. We'll do that next week. But here are some interesting facts from the scripture. And that is Samuel, is, his name is used in the Bible 144 times. Samuel had a prominent position in the minds of the writers of the, book, uh, of the books of the Bible. However, David... David was very prominent in the minds of the writers of the Scripture. Uh, David is used 1,089 times, almost 1,090 times in the Bible, compared to Jesus, 1,275. Now, David is, is used almost as often as the name of Jesus. But that is because... The scripture points out to us that it was prophesied that Christ would come to us through the lineage of David. And so it is no wonder that David's name is mentioned almost as often as that of Jesus. Now the uh, word God, uh, and, and this is referring to God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, the uh, the creator of the universe, the one that he is talking about when he says, by faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command. Now the word God it, with a small uh, letter is used much more often, but the, the term God as the creator of the earth is 
used 4,457 times in the Scripture. And you're going to ask me if I read the Bible and counted all those all the way through. Well, I'd like to say yes, but really, <laughs> I have really good computer software. And so I can find those things in just a matter of seconds. And so it is wonderful, uh, the technology of today. I, I enjoy sermon preparation today as much as I ever did because uh, it, so much of it can be done so quickly. And so uh, anyway, I want to talk about God, and that is the fact that God will build great people to do great things. Now, people build great things. God builds great people. I, I found some bumper sticker, Christian bumper stickers. Uh, several of them I'm going to read for you here. Uh, one said, lean on God before he leans on you. Well, yeah, that's probably good, good advice. But here's one I particularly like. Be fishers of men. You catch them, he'll clean them. And then, God doesn't call the qualified. This is so important for us, I think. God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. And then, if God is your co-pilot, if God is your co-pilot, Swap seats. Why do we want God as our co-pilot? Let him be the pilot. <clears throat> and then here's one. Most people want to serve God, but only in an advisory capacity. We know a lot of people in the world like that. And prayer, I... I just think this is so descriptive of so many of our prayers in the world. Don't give God instructions. Just report for duty. I love that. And then, last of all, we don't change the message. The message changes us. Mankind has done some great things in this world. We have invented ways to cross massive rivers. We have invented ways to fly over those massive rivers and even the oceans. We have not only discovered the means to fly over those massive bodies of water, but we have discovered ways to carry massive amounts of cargo through the air in flight. We have built gigantically tall buildings with thousands of rooms on a small piece of land. We have put our footprints on the moon. We have built quarters, living quarters in space far above the earth. We have built automobiles that can travel a quarter of a mile in less than five seconds from a standing start. We have built submarines that can allow mankind to live underwater for days, weeks, and even months. In fact, today's submarines can stay underwater for longer than three months. But what limits them is not the submarine's ability to stay there, but they usually carry only enough supplies and food for three months. So the crew has to come up for food rather than the sub for fuel. <coughs> We can talk to a person on the other side of the world in real time. And we can watch a picture from underwater, from anywhere in the world, or outer space as it happens. We've conquered space above, and we've conquered space below. Mankind has accomplished great things and built astronomical inventions in this world. But mankind still struggles 
with his own spirit and especially his own soul. He still struggles with the problem of what to do with life. People build great things, but only God builds great people. A young lady was soaking up the sun on the beach when a little boy in his swimming trunks carrying a towel came up to her and asked, Are you a Christian? She was surprised by the question, but replied, Why, yes, I am. And then he asked her, Do you go to church every Sunday? Again, she answered, Yes. And then he asked her, Do you read the Bible and pray every day? Again, she said, Rather reluctantly, but yes. At last, the boy sighed and said, with an obvious relief, oh, that's great. Well, since you're a Christian, will you hold my dollar while I go swimming? In the end, what we really want to know is the character of the person and how it got that way, how the character got that way. I come to two lives surrounded by several other people whose character was built by the will of God. And like I said, I was going to talk to you about Samuel and David, but I want to talk to you about Samuel and Saul because Saul is interwoven in to Samuel's life. And I found it difficult to get away from Saul as I studied Samuel this week. So let's begin with Samuel in the first book of, guess what, Samuel. In the first chapter, we find how Samuel came into the world. But just who, who was Samuel? In order to help us understand the importance of Samuel's life, let's refresh our minds about the history of Israel. God raised up the nation of Israel in Egypt from the family of Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons and a couple of grandsons, and from those 14 people, God raised up 12 tribes who prospered in the northeastern part of Africa in a place called Egypt. The Egyptian Pharaoh made slaves of the Israelites, and then he provided leadership. God provided leadership through the person of Moses who helped the Israelites become free from their oppression. God in his miraculous way led the Israelites to freedom to a desert land known as the Sinai Peninsula. There they wandered around for 40 years because they wouldn't trust God enough to even go into the land of Canaan that God had promised them earlier. Finally, after 40 years of Moses' leadership, a man by the name of Joshua led the people into the land of Canaan. During those first several hundred years in Canaan, God ruled through the leadership of leaders called judges. These men were basically ruling lawyers who knew the laws of God well and had enough wisdom to help the people stay within God's will. Well, at least part of the time, as we found out last week. Forty times in the Old Testament, the Scripture says that the people or one of its leaders did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Four of those judges were Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah, of whom I spoke the last two weeks and are mentioned in the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews. But the people of Israel were not satisfied with following God's way. They looked at all the nations around them and all the kings, so they wanted a king as well. As a result, God yielded to their own free will, and they got a king. Now, through various means, God had some involvement in choosing their kings. We'll talk about how that came about in a moment. And God chose a man by the name of Saul to be their first king. At first, Saul was a good and humble man, 
But the problem with kings was that they were not good theology lawyers. They did not know the laws of God well enough to apply those laws to themselves or to the nation they led. So a little at a time, Saul's power went to his head. And another problem arose that often arose with kings. Almost every king always wanted one of his own descendants to become the next king. This is where the prophets come in. It is also where Samuel comes in. Samuel, in a very political way, became the first prophet of Israel. Samuel and the other prophets helped try to keep the, thing, the kings in line with God's laws. And the prophets of that day had almost as much success in doing so as the preachers of the White House these days have. Now here is the beginning of Samuel's life. Samuel's father, Elkanah, E-L-K-A-N-A-H, had two wives, Hannah and Penina. I guess he liked women with lots of N's in their names because those two names have five N's in them. Now one of the wives, Penina, had several children, but Hannah had no children. She was barren. She could not bear children. And so every year that Elkanah would go to make his sacrifices to the Lord, both of his wives would go with him. Elkanah would give more of the meat from the sacrifice to Hannah than he did to Penina because the scripture says he loved her, indicating that he probably loved her more. But Penina, the scripture says, would provoke Hannah in order to irritate her because Hannah had not been able to have children. <clears throat> and the Bible says she did this year after year. In fact, the Bible says her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. <clears throat> her husband tried to console her, but it did little good. One year they were worshiping at the temple of the Lord, the scripture says, where Eli the priest was serving. <clears throat> the scripture says, in bitterness of soul, Hannah wept much and prayed to the Lord. She promised God that if he gave her a son, he would dedicate him to the Lord. <clears throat> her prayer was so fervent that Eli thought, her to be drunk, and so he got up from his seat and approached her and said, How long will you keep on getting drunk? Get rid of your wine. But Hannah assured Eli that she was not drunk. She was praying fervently to the Lord. The Bible says in the 20th verse of 1 Samuel chapter 1, So in the course of time, Hannah conceived and gave birth to a son. And she named him Samuel, saying, Because I asked the Lord for him. When Samuel was old enough, but still very young, <clears throat> Hannah took him to Eli, the priest, who a few years earlier saw her praying and thought her drunk. She said to him, As surely as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. And 1 Samuel, the first chapter, verse 27, says, I prayed for this child, and the Lord has granted me what I ask of him. So now I give him to the Lord, for his whole life he will be given over to the Lord. <clears throat> and the scripture says, he worshiped the Lord there, meaning Eli. He, Eli, worshiped the Lord. And Samuel grew up under the instruction of the priest Eli, and he became the first real prophet for the nation of Israel. And perhaps the greatest of all prophets of Israel. Samuel's birth came out of the desperate humility of Hannah. At least you might say Hannah's desperation certainly had influenced her humility. She simply wanted to have a child. 
If it were not bad enough that she could not bear children, she had the problem that other women made fun of her for not being able to do so, especially Elkanah's other wife, Penina. You'll discover that many men in the Old Testament had more than one wife. That does not mean that God approved of that relationship. Adam was given one wife created by God. <clears throat> that was God's ideal familial relationship. Mankind messes with things out of desperation and convenience and lust and things don't work out so well in the end usually. Often men had more than one wife in that period of time for one or more of several reasons. One simply was lust. David took Bathsheba from another man just because he thought her beautiful. Did God approve of that? No. But God gives us free will and He still worked out His redemptive history in spite of the fact that mankind messes everything up. Guess what? King Solomon was the son of Bathsheba. <clears throat> Another reason that the men of that day married more than one wife was to continue the family name. In those days, many of the women, even those we read about in the Bible, were barren, much like Hannah, unable to bear children. And so it was appropriate in that society, not, not in God's sight, but in that society for a man to take another wife in order to have children. Just because man did something in the Bible doesn't mean that God approved of it. We have to remember that. Another reason that men of that day married more than one wife was to provide for women who had no other means of livelihood. <clears throat> it was an economic situation that motivated it. Did God approve of those relationships? No. But God carried out His redemptive history even though man exercised his own free will. And here we have Hannah who is very distraught because of the relationship of a second wife, even though the scripture is clear that Elkanah evidently loved her more than his other wife. So Samuel was born out of a desperate desire on Hannah's part to have a child, but she was humble enough to dedicate him to God, and God blessed her. The scripture says, with three more sons and two more daughters. <clears throat> because both Samuel and his mother Hannah lived their lives in humility toward God, God did great things in their lives. God did great things with Samuel's life, and he led Samuel as both a judge and a prophet of Israel. Samuel was a true theological lawyer for Israel. But Samuel grew up, and his sons did not follow in the way of the Lord. So the people of Israel asked for a king. <clears throat> and so be careful. God may bring or build Humility from your greatness. 1 Samuel, the 8th chapter, verse 4. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel in Ramah. They said to him, You are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. But when they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord, <clears throat> and the Lord told him, listen to all the people are saying to you. It is not you that they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. As they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until this day forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. Now listen to them. But warn them solemnly and let them know what the king who will reign over them will do. <clears throat> it 
so the scripture says, Samuel told all the words of the, that the Lord had said to him to the people who are asking him for a king. He said, this is what the king will do who will reign over you. He will take your sons and make them serve with his chariots and horses. They will run in front of the chariots. Some he will assign to be commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties and others to plow his ground and reap his harvest and still others to make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his attendants. He will take a tenth of your grain and of your vintage and give it to his officials. Oh my, that we would only, he would only take a tenth, huh? In other words, what God is telling him, he's going to tax you to death. Your men servants and maids servants and the best of your cattle and donkeys he will take for his own. He will take a tenth of your flocks and you will become his slaves. And when that day comes you will cry out for the relief from the king you have chosen. And the Lord will not answer you in that day. Wow. Be careful what you ask for. But the people refused to listen to Samuel, the scripture says. No, they said. We want a king over us. Then we will be like all the other nations with the king to lead us. Go out before us and fight our battles for us. When Samuel heard all the people said, he repeated it before the Lord. And the Lord answered him, listen to them and give them a king. What can I do? Shrug their shoulders. And God's you see, what God was doing is letting them exercise their free will. You see, the problem of exercising our free will and not listening to God's instructions is it gets us in trouble. The time came for God to lead Samuel through the task of choosing the first king of Israel. God led him to a man named Saul. And don't confuse this Saul of the Old Testament with the Saul of Tarsus in the book of Acts in the New Testament. They are completely two different men from different periods of time. The story of Saul, the first king of Israel, begins in 1 Samuel, the ninth chapter. Saul and one of the, uh, the family servants had gone looking for some donkeys that the father had lost. The father had asked his son Saul to go find the donkeys. And so Saul and the servant, they had wandered from town to town looking for the donkeys and had not been able to find them. And finally Saul says to his servant, you know, it's getting late. We'd better head home or my father would begin to worry more about us than he is about our donkeys. The servant said, just a, a little while longer because I, I know a man in the next town He's a man of God, and we'll try to find him and ask him if he's able to help us find our donkeys. So to shorten the story just a bit, they did find Samuel, the man of God, in the next town. Samuel told Saul not to worry about the donkeys. They had been found. However, that encounter with Samuel became the occasion for Samuel to inform Saul that God had chosen him to be the very first king of Israel. And 1 Samuel 9 verse 20 says, And to whom is all the desire of Israel turned? If not to you and all your father's family. And here is Saul's response. In a humble way, Saul answered, 1 Samuel 9 21, But am I not a Benjamite? from the smallest tribe of Israel? And is not my clan the least of all the clans of the tribe of Benjamin? Why do you say such a thing to me? I don't have the background to be a king. The scripture says in 1 Samuel 10 verse 6, the Spirit of the Lord 
will come upon you in power and you will prophesy with them and you'll be changed into a different person. And then in the 11th chapter of 1 Samuel, the scripture says in verse 9, as Saul turned to leave Samuel, God changed Saul's heart and all these signs were fulfilled that day. And when they arrived at Gibeah, a procession of prophets met him. The Spirit of God came upon him in power and he joined in their prophesying. And when all those who had formerly known him saw him prophesying with the prophets, they asked each other, What is this that has happened to the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? When Saul got home from looking for the donkeys, his uncle asked him, Where have you been? And Saul answered, Looking for the donkeys looking for the donkeys. And then Saul also told his uncle that when he couldn't find the donkeys, he went to find Samuel. And Samuel found him and helped him find the donkeys. The scripture says in 1 Samuel 10, verse 16, Saul replied, he assured us that the donkeys had been found. And then that's the end of quote. And then the scripture says, but he did not tell his uncle what Samuel had said about the fact that they wanted to make him king of Israel. <clears throat> the whole revival had started in Saul's life that he did not share with his uncle or his family. And when Samuel came to town to anoint Saul king, they could not find Saul. They finally did find him hiding among the baggage of the last airline flight from L.A. I, I don't know where the baggage came from. That scripture just says they found him among the baggage. Now Saul was a head taller than everybody else in town. And so his head was probably popping up among the baggage somewhere. So they found him. And the scripture says there was Saul curled up on the baggage chute, going round and round with all the suitcases. <laughs> no, it doesn't say that. You see, the point is, Saul started out as a humble man. But as so often happens, power and glory and fame destroys the humility of the soul. Listen to what happens after Saul has been in power for really not so very long. 1 Samuel 15 says, Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel, I am grieved that I have made Saul king, because he has turned away from me and has not carried out my instruction." Samuel was troubled and he cried out to the Lord all that night. And early in the morning Samuel got up and went to meet Saul, but he was told Saul has gone to Carmel. There he has set up a monument in his own honor. Saul had turned away from following the precepts of God and turned to following his own. Fame and glory had destroyed the humility of the soul. Eventually Samuel came to Saul and said, Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. And that will bring us to David, of whom I will speak next week. <clears throat> but let me conclude my message today with this. God builds great people to build great things. But man cannot build great things unless God has built great people. Humility is not a state of being passive. Humility is simply willingness to obey God in whatever He asks of us. 
Humility is being able to let God be the pilot instead of the co-pilot. There's a story about a woman named Gladys Allward. She was a missionary to China many years ago. She was forced to flee when the Japanese invaded Yangcheng. But she did not want to leave her work behind. With only one assistant, she led more than a hundred orphans over the mountains toward what was known at that time as Free China. In their book called The Hidden Prince of Greatness, Ray Benson and Renelda Hunsicker tell us what happened. During Gladys's harrowing journey out of that war-torn Yangcheng, she grappled with despair as never before. After passing a sleepless night, she faced the morning with no hope of reaching safety with her hundred orphans. A 13-year-old girl in the group reminded her of the much-loved story of Moses and the Israelites crossing the Red Sea. But I'm not Moses, Gladys cried in desperation. Of course you aren't, the girl said, but Jehovah is still God. When Gladys and the orphans finally did make it through, they proved once again that no matter how inadequate we feel, God is still God and we can trust in Him. More importantly, we must trust in Him. God builds great people to do great things, but if we forget God, our greatness may crumble under the pressure of our arrogance, as did that of Saul. It is invitation time. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Father in heaven, I pray for our church. I pray, Lord, for those who are faithful to you. That you might bless them in this special day and this special way. I pray for the continued strength of their faith. I pray, Lord, for those who need to put you first in their life. So thank you for the time we have to offer this invitation that those who want to place their faith and trust in you may do, to, do so this day. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. For it is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you have a decision to make for Christ, come as we sing together.
Now, Lotus Alton didn't yeah. sing with us, and I thought that would have been really good, but uh, we'll have to have him step up his he game. Should be next a, if he Skyped it or something, we could have been. <laughs> yeah, we just Bill, next time. would you close us in a word of prayer, please? Certainly. Thank you. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you that you have protected and granted us this time to worship and come together before you, with you. We ask that the word we heard today be planted seeds in our hearts and spring forth to an abundance a hundredfold. We ask your blessings and protection as we go forth into the world. And as we go, may your light shine. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Join us in our last praise hymn today, Peace Like a River. And I just want to... Uh, Hope and pray that everybody has a wonderful week and that you're back here again next Sunday. And I truly hope Alton's back here next Sunday. And we'll see. But uh, that was pretty good. That was. Yeah. Just like yeah, that was a lot of work in that. Just to, well, he wasn't feeling it. Yeah, so. Supposedly uh, the Bible study this evening. I mean, the, in the evening this Wednesday. Yeah, this Wednesday. We'll watch your emails because he'll probably let us know if it's not going to be good. And uh, so pray for our pastor. And uh, we just thank you so much for being here. Please join us in peace like a river.